Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, my high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, today we're going to be checking out the armchair historian. He and his crew have posted a video that caught my attention and is one of my interested subjects, and that is the Aztec Empire. Now, this video is called Fall of the Aztecs, How 400 Spaniards Toppled an Empire. We just talked about this in my AP history classes this week, so I've had this on my mind. So while that's still fresh, I'm definitely excited to check this out and add any commentary I can. All right, make sure you are following the Armchair Historian. This original video will be linked down below, so please support it, give it a view, like, and again, subscribe to the channel. All right, let's do this. All right, here we go. At the start of 1519, the Aztec Empire was a dominant force in Mesoamerica. Great graphics, by the way. Although commonly seen as one people, the Aztec Empire actually began in 1428 as an alliance between the three city-states of Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, yeah. and Tlacopan. And before the alliance, they existed before even, you know, decades, probably even a century or two before that even. Among these, Tenochtitlan would soon rise above the others, gaining infamy in the eyes of their tributaries. Those unfortunate enough to fall under its yoke were forced to supply the Triple Alliance not only with raw materials, but also with a steady flow of prisoners for human sacrifice. Yeah, yeah this uh, the Aztecs were a tributary empire, so you think of it like a bullying fee. It's like they're going to let you retain your autonomy if you give up significant amounts of tribute, again, in the, the form of uh, food, labor, goods like that. And also you're pretty much occupied like a police state as well. They weren't well liked by a lot of people. Though it is not entirely clear how many people were sacrificed in total, it is believed that in times of drought, thousands of human lives would be ritually killed over a matter of days. Aztec warriors also embarked on what was known as flower wars to capture prisoners for sacrifice, and mm -hmm. some members of the Aztec aristocracy yeah. even cannibalized the bodies of some of the victims. Having said that, life in Tenochtitlan entailed more than just an endless stream of gruesome offerings and peculiar appetites. The Mexica, as the city's inhabitants were called. Yeah, uh, they're not called the Aztecs. That's a term that's been put on them. Mexica. Greatly valued scholarship, and Tenochtitlan contained several large libraries with manuscripts on a wide range of topics, ranging from religion and genealogies to government and geography. Very extensively educated. The fateful event that would radically alter the course of Mesoamerican history came in February 1519, when a group of several hundred conquistadors landed in the Gulf of Mexico About 450, in search of probably. glorious cities rumored to be filled with gold. Its leader, Hernán Cortés, was following in the footsteps, or rather, the sails of, two prior expeditions which had ventured into the Gulf before him. But it, It's been a long time since I've watched Armchair Historian, but for how, lo how long is this... This really cool. I really love this art style right now. Also, the uh, the dimensions of the visuals. It's very uh, widescreen. How long has um, Griffin and his crew been doing this? This is really cool looking. I'm loving but it. Unlike really his up the game. Up Cortez' the game. expedition was rife with controversy from the very start. After having butted heads with the Cuban governor, Diego Velazquez, Cortez had his expeditionary charter revoked at the last moment. Not one to take no for an answer, yeah, Cortez decided Cortez. to ignore the order yeah. and, in an open act of mutiny, set sail for Mesoamerica. It makes sense. You're going to see him do this a lot when he gets to the Americas as well. A lot of times he could give up, turn back. Dude is relentless. Facing certain imprisonment or even death, Cortez was highly aware of the absolute necessity of his expedition's success. Luckily for him, help <laughs> in this regard would soon arrive that in Pokemon? unexpected form. Once a novelty adorning the wrists of the rich and royalty, thanks to modern conflicts like the First World War, wristwatches soon transitioned into vital instruments of war with soldiers relying on them to synchronize critical operations, shifting the wristwatch's status from ornamental Incoming to indispensable. Ad? Today, wristwatches don't just help manage time, but they also remind us to take time for ourselves whenever needed. Holzkern, the sponsor of today's video, continues I like stuff on my wrist. I don't wear watches. Timeless elegance I don't like stuff on me. I feel confined. No necklaces, no Their high watches, nothing. Their high-quality watches, jewelry, and accessories are the perfect gift 
for any occasion or style. Is that pretty sharp I've had looking, my though? Holzkern watch for several months, Griffin. and I wear it regularly during my on-screen scenes. I also really enjoy these amazing handcrafted sunglasses that I just received. Yeah. All pieces are guaranteed for 24 months, and ordering online is easy with free duty and import tax-free shipping to the U.S. and most EU countries within two to five days. Followers who use our special discount code Crazy. ARMCHAIR15 at checkout will receive 15% off of all products. Support our channel by clicking the link and choose your own personal piece of nature for everyday life with Holzkern. On their way to their first stop in the Yucatan Peninsula, the conquistadors happened upon a shipwrecked Spaniard by the name of Jerónimo de Aguilar. Aguilar, who had learned to speak Mayan, was promptly brought aboard as Cortés' personal translator. A few weeks later, Aguilar would prove his usefulness during peace talks with the Patanchan, a Mayan city-state that the conquistadors had encountered a few weeks into their expedition. As a peace offer, the Mayans provided Cortes with 20 slaves, among whom a woman who spoke both Mayan as well as the Aztec language, Nahuatl. Together, Nahuatl. Aguilar yeah. and the slave woman, who would become known as La Malinche, would form Malinche. a crucial link for Cortes to communicate with the Aztec people. There are those other in instances of horrible miscommunications as you can imagine between the Europeans and indigenous peoples of the Americas and having something like this is going to be huge. There's a lot of that going down. You're going to see that a lot with Francisco Pizarro down in the Inca empire too. A whole bunch of those that end up deadly when there was just basically just miscommunications that way. So this kind of stuff is, is interesting. This is something I get asked by students a lot about communication and stuff like that. But um, we're, we're, you know, over 20 years into Spanish involvement into the Americas going back to Columbus. Um, and Cortez was not the first one of these conquistador type groups or people to get in trouble with the Spanish. Columbus did as well. He was, uh, a lot of people talk about looking at him through the scope of his time, and he was seen as brutal by the Spanish themselves, who basically uh, had him as a criminal. But anyway, so you can see Cortez has the same thing. Armed with the power on. of language, as well as of steel and gunpowder, the Spaniards set sail for their final destination. Upon arrival, the nifty Cortez declared the establishment of Villa Rica de la Veracruz, marking the first Spanish colony in Mesoamerica. However, in reality, Veracruz was not much more than a name on a map, and primarily served as a means for Cortez to take advantage of Spanish law in an attempt thing. to escape the jurisdiction of Governor Velazquez. Cortez yeah, th this is going to be a major part of what Cortez is going to do is establish these relationships with people um, because of the strength of numbers, right? Uh, he's going to find out the Aztec Empire is enormous. It was probably about 25 million people at this time. He has a very small force. Yes, they have some good military equipment and stuff like that. Superb toe-to-toe -to -toe with uh, the native, uh, indigenous peoples. But all of this is this is his savvy as a diplomat in establishing these relationships, of course, to, to serve him and to serve the Spanish um, when they need to, which is going to be coming up here when he needs to raise an army. His arrival, in the meantime, had not gone unnoticed, and his party was soon welcomed by representatives of the Aztec Emperor Moctezuma. Despite their seeming lack of hostility, Cortes knew that these formalities were unlikely to last, and he was all too aware of the pressing need to address his glaring he's, he's numerical inferiority. Fortunately for the Spaniards, the years dude, yeah. of often brutal Aztec rule had left few friends among their tributaries, and many, Easy. like the Totonac Confederacy, were relatively easily persuaded to turn against their hated overlords. This has been going on for decades and even centuries. It was not hard to do that. There's plenty of people that have been waiting to stick it to the Aztecs, and Cortes realized that very quickly um, to his advantage. Upon hearing of the news of the Spanish Totonac alliance, Moctezuma sensed trouble and sent forth another score of polite ambassadors bearing gifts of gold and cloth in a doomed attempt to appease the Spaniards and perhaps to keep an eye on their movements, but most of all, to dissuade them from visiting Tenochtitlan. Cortes, however, felt encouraged rather than dissuaded by the lavish gifts of gold and ordered a daring march toward the city. 
it was all or nothing for the Spanish leader, and to ensure the loyalty of his own men, he made sure to scuttle his ships before setting off. Yep. Yeah. Uh, basically break them down, like, like take them, like dismantle them, dismantle them. He's like, no, no one's bailing. We will not be returning off of this land until I say so. Dismantle the ships. So again, we're saying this guy is a, a, a don't take no for an answer, dude. Violence erupted when Talaxcalan warriors began harrying the column as it passed through Talaxcaltecan territory two weeks later. The bloodshed spread into September as the Spanish camp was attacked by day, while Cortez men raided Talaxcalteca villages by night. After 18 days of brutal warfare, which had come at the cost of half of the Spanish cavalry and a fifth of Cortez men, peace finally returned to the territory. Cortez had convinced the harassers that they had a common enemy in the Aztecs. Exactly. The Tlaxcalans had reason to it's resent the empire, Tlaxcal. as it had conquered most of their territory during their yearly flower wars, which had been going on for nearly a century. Seeing a golden opportunity for retribution, the Tlaxcalans lowered their arms and joined the march to the city. Yep. That being said, Enemy of your enemy is your friend. You're not, they're not friends, right? But enemy of your enemy is your friend is very much a true thing in history. We see it all the time. Said, the violence did not stop there. Before the Spanish went to Tenochtitlan, they marched alongside their Talax Calteca allies on the city of Cholula and massacred its civilian population over the course of several days. Cholula, an important religious center, had formerly been part of the Tlaxcalan sphere of influence before switching sides and allying with the Aztecs. The exact reasons for the massacre are disputed, but it may have been a mixture of the Tlaxcalans wanting to get rid of a political rival and the Spanish wanting to send a message to rival cities. While it Fair is enough. clear that many city-states had a grudge with the Aztecs, at Cholula, the Spanish clearly demonstrated what would happen That's if cities calendar, didn't ally Aztec with them. Calendar. By the first week of November, the surviving conquistadors finally laid eyes on Tenochtitlan. So much she talks about the Home city. Home to over 300,000 inhabitants, this massive city... Was it up to 3,000? It's interesting. Um, I... I, that's more than I thought. I was under pressure. It was about 200,000, maybe 250. But um, it's it's the biggest city in the Western Hemisphere and actually one of the most populated cities on the planet. It dwarfed almost all of its contemporary European counterparts. The vista of its many London, canals, Paris, all densely that. populated neighborhoods, and imposing temples and palaces struck the approaching Spaniards with awe and prompted some to wonder whether they were in a dream. City on the Leak. Having failed to dissuade him, yeah. If you don't know about that, founding of Tenochtitlan was actually a um, like almost like a mythological story. The indigenous Aztecs they were nomadic, and in the Valley of Mexico, where that where that is, um, there's the lake, right? Very high mountain lake, and on the island there was a um, something they saw as an omen there, which was bird perched on a cactus with a snake in its mouth and that was an omen basically that this should be their their home and, their, and, and settle there so but geographically it's a horrible place it's on an island it's very marshy the um the land needs a ton of manipulation which is why they had to hand build their farms um basically as extensions to the island they're called chinampas um the amount of environmental manipulation by this group was incredible because again it's not a very good geography um and then had to connect the island to the the shoreline with um, three wooden causeways to do that but because of that also made it such a unique city and blew people away when they saw it like the spanish and you could read their journals talk about that refer to it as you know the venice of the west or venice of the new world with its water channels visiting and the city stuff. moctezuma now felt obliged to invite cortez into his palace yeah, it was inevitable it was here that the conquistadors discovered a secret room where the emperor kept his treasure the sight of numerous golden objects jewels plates and ingots dumbfounded the spaniards yeah and they they value that differently because that wasn't used as a currency for the Aztecs uh, but for the Spanish it was and it was more valuable the gold is like more valuable to the Spanish that it's just being very you know pretty you know to, to something like the Aztecs and that that like 
greed, the level that they had for for that gold, like astonished the Aztecs. Like, wow, you guys are really into this. Having located the rumored treasure trove, Cortez began to pressure Moctezuma by asking him to allow his men to erect a cross and an image of the Virgin Mary next to two large Aztec idols. Naturally, this provocative request was cause for considerable consternation sure. among the Mexicas, causing an eruption of violence that cost the lives of seven Spaniards. Realizing the precarity of their situation, Cortes retaliated by putting Moctezuma under house arrest in the palace, assuming personal control over the city. By, something that, by the way, something to note about here is most every account we have of all of these interactions are from the Spanish. Um, because the Spanish largely destroyed a lot of these records, there are little to no surviving um, contemporary accounts of this from the indigenous perspective. And we do have to take a lot of things with a grain of salt because it's also been shown that Cortez has lied about things um, about this, uh, like the fact that they he, he went back to Spain and said that they thought he was a god and stuff like that, uh, which didn't happen. And so there's, yeah, there's been some... Uh, some inaccuracies with that. But anyway, that, not to say any of this was just something to understand kind of in the larger context there. So, but nevertheless, you do see the also big misunderstanding too of, uh, of religious beliefs too. And I think the Spanish came in also very ignorant of what religion is like outside of their point of view of their Roman Catholicism, what religion looks like and what it is. And they don't understand or really care to understand um, anything uh, about that and about uh, what others believe and how it might be it might be interpreted by them. With the emperor essentially taken hostage, the Spaniards hoped to dissuade the Aztecs from further resistance. Didn't work. Moctezuma, on his part, continued to stand firm behind his policy of diplomacy and peace. After firmly refusing advice from his chieftains to attack the conquistadors, he finally allowed Cortes' men to build a Catholic altar on the temple. It was the first real sign that the once mighty emperor of the great Aztec Empire had been reduced to little more than a He's puppet a puppet. of yeah. Cortes. People turned Meanwhile, on him. Meanwhile, off to the east, another significant development was taking place. While Cortes executed his coup d'etat, 900 conquistadors under the command of Panfilo de Narvaez were landing on the orders of Governor Velasquez. Their objective? To deal with Cortes. He's doing this while being the news, Cortes on the run. His best men and set off to face Narvaez in battle. Leave what this does show you is how devoted his men were to him. Right. It happens a lot in military history where you're more devoted to a specific general. And Cortez was young. He's like in his 20s. Um, but how they yeah, devoted they can be to him rather than the idea of the state. But Julius Caesar, for example, for that, where his soldiers are more loyal to him than to like the Roman Senate or something like that. Leaving Pedro That's de dangerous. Alvarado and a small garrison in charge of the city. This would turn out to be a fateful decision, as the cruel and easily angered Alvarado had little patience and even less respect for the Aztec people. And in more brutal in Cortez. 22, 1520, Moctezuma asked for permission to celebrate an Aztec festival, which included human sacrifice. Alvarado and his men interrupted the festivities, killing nearly all of the mostly unarmed warriors and noblemen inside of the great temple. We've read these accounts because they're they, they, they're Spanish diary accounts from this um, in in my AP class, uh, and yeah, it's like it, it, it's so interesting when you look at that because they're like, dude, this party was awesome, right? So if, if you heard what Griffin was saying, they um, they there's this festival happening and the Spanish are invited there, and like at first it's awesome, they're like eating good food and they like they have these like beautiful uh, like dancers and they've got cool costumes and all this stuff. And then it comes to the point of the uh, of the festival where the human sacrifice takes place, and there the mood changed big time for the Spanish. And at a such an interesting, I don't know if you want to call it twist of irony, whatever. They see the sacrifice, and they're like, "You guys are awful. You guys are barbaric." And then in turn, then slaughter the priests <laughs> for being barbaric. Check out our library of over 100 exclusive videos on More Armchair added. History TV. New videos come out every week, and we create Armchair Historian Originals awesome every to have single a, month. Another Alvarado's good place for men content claimed there. to have merely acted to prevent human sacrifice, while survivors retorted that the Spaniards had grown wild at the sight of gold jewelry that those in attendance were wearing. 
Right. Hearing of the They're massacre, like foaming at the Mizuma mouth. again urged for cooler heads to prevail and ordered his people to stand down. Main the like Aztecs, this. however, had had enough yep. and rose up in revolt. Yeah. Due east, Cortez had managed to sneak up on Nervais at Sempuala and ordered his men to attack at nightfall. His mixed group of 250 Spaniards and 200 natives soundly defeated Narvaez's numerically superior force, which included horsemen and artillery. In an ultimate slap to the face to Governor Velasquez, the survivors were then convinced to join Cortez with promises <laughs> of boundless Aztec riches. Of course. Arriving back at Tenochtitlan, Cortez found Alvarado's men under siege in the palace. Acting quickly, Cortez ordered Moctezuma to address his people in a final doomed attempt to restore peace and allow the Spaniards to peacefully withdraw from the city. It's, I mean, th th there was a riot. They were going to kill the Spaniards. They were going to take out. Uh, they were going to take out Moctezuma and then take out the Spaniards. This is a last ditch effort. He's like, you got to stop this. And pretty much sword to his throat there, saying, Moctezuma, put these guy, put these people down. However, this desperate gesture merely stoked the pyres of fury. Jeers rose from the crowd as Moctezuma faced a rain of stones and darts. His people had had enough of their emperor and had in fact already chosen to elect his successor, Huitlauic. The tragic Moctezuma would not survive the assault, though the Aztecs would later claim that he was killed by the Spaniards after his usefulness to them had expired. That, that's, that's what I was going to say. Uh, it goes back to the... Uh, the perspective, and again, you got to take all this the grain of the salt, a grain of salt, because we don't have um, uh, other site uh, of resources. And there could be some truth to that, where they're saying at the end they killed him once he was uh, not useful anymore, because <laughs> although it, it happened in the future, another about 15, 20 years later, that's essentially what um, Francisco Pizarro and the Spanish con conquistadors did with the emperor of the Inca Empire, Atahualpa, basically ransomed him, and then once he wasn't useful, they murdered him. So. With their bargaining chip There's gone, a history and this. with supplies rapidly dwindling, Cortez realized that time was running out. He ordered his men to break out at night with as much gold and other treasure as they could carry. The party headed west under the cover of a welcome rainstorm, winding their way through the sleeping city. Yeah. Good However, to sneak out. before long, they were spotted, and the alarm was sounded. Within no time, a crowd of Aztecs emerged from their houses to attack the fleeing column. While hundreds of men... In that, that, uh, by the way, that was cool that he put that there. Um, that's the Aztec death whistle. So, let's see. Proud see what this Aztecs guy's holding? Um, it's a, out, out of a skull, they would carve an opening in it and blow into it, and it was supposed to sound like a screaming person. It's called the Aztec death whistle, again, made out of skull. And it said that Aztec warriors would use those in battle when they would, you know, like charge an enemy. They'd all be blowing these, and it would make their army sound frightening and bigger than um, what they actually were. Merged you can uh, look up on YouTube. You can see people play those, and, like, and, and uh, you can hear what they sound like. They're pretty scary houses to attack the fleeing column while and it did sound men, if you heard that it did sound like that i've heard one in canoes harassed cortez men as they fought their way across the causeway leading out of the city they barely made it out some soldiers lost their footing and drowned in the lake weighed down by all their equipment and the treasure that they had so desired they basically took everything they could cortez carry himself was well ahead of the group leading a vanguard of yeah, horsemen leaving the rest of his men behind to fend for themselves Upon reaching safety at the village of Tacuba, the Spanish leader had a change of heart and turned around to come to the aid of those still fighting their way out. Along the way, what he a found nice a guy. badly wounded Alvarado with a group of Spaniards and Tlaxcaltecs. According to conquistador Diaz del Castillo, it was at this point that Cortes broke down in tears. During the bloody breakout attempt, an estimated four to 800 Spaniards had been killed, drowned, or captured, while around 1,000 Tlax Caltex had La noche triste, suffered the same fate. In terms of equipment, all of the artillery and most of the horses had been lost, and the exhausted and mostly wounded survivors were left to make do with whatever they had managed to carry along. Cortes' alleged sorrow at the sight of this tragedy solidified it in Spanish and Mexican history as the Night of Sorrows. Despite their apparent weakness, sad Cortes' night. men were far from defeated. About a week later, the Aztecs struck again at Otumba in an attempt to deliver the killing blow. 
but their victory during the Night of Sorrows had made the Aztecs overconfident, and the Spaniards' skillful use of cavalry and targeting known leaders ultimately sent their army into disarray. Having fought off his pursuers, Cortes withdrew his remaining men to the relative safety of Tlaxcala to rest and reorganize. Though defeated on the field of battle, the Aztecs had retaken control over their capital. This victory, however, would be short-lived, as soon a far more lethal and insidious enemy would Disease. arrive in the form of smallpox. This stuff had already has already been going around, um, but yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be the killer again. You gotta keep be sure to keep in mind that through all of these military engagements, the Spanish are, are not gonna have any success without the um, locals. Uh, fighting with them or at least giving them information and helping them organize. Yes, Spanish strong toe to toe, but are outnumbered in every scenario. Having no Small prior bolts. contact with this disease, the vulnerable Aztecs were at its mercy. Thousands perished in short succession. Among them, the new emperor Cuitlahuac. And by the end of the year 1520, it is estimated that the disease had killed some 8 million people in the area now known as Mexico. It's insane. Um, quick immunity kind of lesson, because one thing I get asked is, um, with the disease, you know, being such a prevalent part of this experience, why was it so one-sided? Um, it, it, it's for this reason. So most of these kind of diseases, smallpox, measles, etc., um, are exposed to to humans through proximity of uh, domesticated animals, especially like like cows and and, and pigs. Um, and centuries, millennia, whatever, of Europeans, Eurasian, just people in general, having lived with that proximity, developed an immunity. Now, in the Americas, they don't have large domesticated animals that they live with. So there aren't their own diseases to be able to spread. I mean, there were some mostly like sexually transmitted diseases, I think syphilis being one that went back to the uh, uh, to the Spanish. But again, the lack of domestication, domesticated animals in the Western Hemisphere is a reason why this was so one sided. Having licked their wounds from the Night of Sorrows and the Battle of Otumba, Cortes men were reinforced by more native allies from Texcoco yeah, and once down. again set off for Tenochtitlan. I think about 100,000 now. It's about, it's about 11 months later, by the way, um, less than a month, or uh, sorry, a year. So recruiting, and I, I want to say the number got up to about 100,000. Um, correct me on that, uh, for the army that he raises to return to Tenochtitlan. Well aware That's of the massive. weakened state of the Aztec Empire, the Spanish leaders undoubtedly expected a swift victory. However, to their surprise, the stubborn defenders of the city refused to yield. Frustrated, the Spaniards ordered Talax Calteca laborers to construct cannon-mounted brigantines to take control of the lake. Potable water to the city was cut off on May 10th, yet by the end of June, its defenders still stood firm. They have like essentially aqueducts um, to, to get fresh water there. Remember how they dismantled ships and stuff like that? They still got materials and the know-how and the weaponry to make warships. So you just got to bring that stuff over from the coast and make yourself some little boats. And yes, we got naval warfare at 10,000 feet altitude, which is what that lake is at. Various attempts to end the siege through diplomacy failed. Having run out of patience, Cortes ordered a massive assault on the city to take the market of Tlate Lolco, but his men were forced to retreat in the face of heavy resistance. Cortes himself was captured during the fighting and was fortunate to escape with his life when his men came to the rescue. Brutal urban combat and sustained fanatical resistance persisted until the remaining defenders made their last stand at Plaza Mayor, where they- One of the biggest sieges, largest scale sieges in world history. I mean, truly, here at Tenoch Street Line. They finally surrendered on August 13th. It's weeks, weeks. The reign of Cuauhtémoc, the last Aztec emperor, ended when he was captured trying to flee the city in a canoe. But the catastrophe that had befallen Tenochtitlan would not end there. The victorious Spaniards and their native allies mercilessly sacked the city in search of gold and revenge. Just everything. Cortes, on his Destroy part, everything. would be rewarded for the astounding success of his valiant expedition by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V by being named Captain General of the Vice Royalty of New Spain in October of 1522. <laughs> Let's be honest. They talk about that as like an, like an extension of the Holy Roman Empire, but guys like Cortes and what's going on in the Americas are very much acting independently. All right, you could say Charles is in control of this. He's not. <laughs> Cortez's lethal gamble had paid off. The mutinous soldier had become the new hero of Spain. 
Within just two short years, Hernán Cortés' relatively small group of conquistadors had managed to vanquish an empire. These I don't love that wording because of the, I mean, we'll, we'll let him, uh, him, him get that, but it's Hernán Cortés and an already disgruntled, enormous population of Aztecs. He's, he's facilitating, in a lot of ways, civil war here of a scenario that was already ripe for this assault on the Aztec Empire. It's a joint, very much a joint operation. Scale of the but this is very much how the story has gone down when the story gets back to Spain. That was very much a, you know, like we're saying, a, a small group of heroic Spaniards going in and toppling this mighty empire with their uh, cunning and technology and all that. Expedition, alongside its capture in treasure, would not be matched until the 1532 conquest of the Incan Empire in modern day Peru. Incan Empire a lot smaller. However, um, Incan Empire is uh, more than half the size of it. So 25 million probably for the Aztecs, probably around 11 million for the Inca, who also, uh, exact same thing happens. Massive civil war actually already happened in the Inca empire that Pizarro and his crew were already able to do to get in involved in that when there's already like a, I don't know how many percentage of people were against the Inca at that time. Um, we're able to take it right out of the the, the conquistador playbook of, of uh, Hernan Cortez. However, as we've seen, Cortez' conquest was far from a straightforward military affair. Besides the Spaniards' technological and tactical superiority, it was the vital support of large numbers of native allies, yes. the overcaution and inaction of Moctezuma, as well as the brutal effects of the smallpox epidemic. Good job. That all played Griffin did a good job there. Put it in that perspective. You got to rank them in three ways, right? You got three reasons why this conquest happened. Yes, you got Spanish military superiority, but of the three, it's the least important. Uh, the alliances um, are definitely at the middle there by far it's disease nothing of this nothing of this none of this happens without the disease the disease killed about 90 percent of a population that is pushing 30 million people that is what destroyed the empire it apart in the rapid toppling of the aztec empire its fall marked the start of further spanish conquests in the region ultimately leading to the spanish control over the entirety of mesoamerica Conquest, in turn, was followed by the mass conversion of the indigenous people to Catholicism. Yep. And before long, intermarriage between ethnic Spaniards and natives would become common occurrences, yep. marking the beginning of the modern Mexican nation. Sure. Mestizo population. And you see the Spanish did that a lot more than like the French and the English did when it comes to intermarriage and stuff. The Spanish did a lot of that creating a majority mestizo population or mixed race um, population. Special thanks to Hulse Karen for sponsoring this video. All right, final thoughts. All right, great job by Griffin and his crew. Again, it's been a long time since I've checked in on these guys um, making so many things. They do a lot of American history and stuff like that, which is not as much of what I cover. I cover a lot of the world history stuff, and I'm glad that they're they're doing that because it becomes a little more relevant to my interests uh, they do so much on you know again american history american military history and stuff like that when they get out here and um do the aztec stuff and i, I see that uh, something on uh, roman soldiers recently i was thinking of checking out i know for them they're probably like oh it doesn't get as many views and you're talking about a massive channel right he has over two million subs and you know all these videos get a million and you know he may have a few hundred thousand views that might seem less for these world topics. I'm so glad that they're doing that. And I'll definitely keep my interest in covering more uh, from um, Griffin and his crew, who I respect so much of what they do and how well they do this. They really are impressive. So anyway, I think I added uh, some things along the way. So let me know what you think um, about all of this. And what do you think kind of the legacy should really be that we take out of this of how did the Aztec Empire fall? What's the best way to involve all the nuance as part of it to get that accurate description? Let me know down below and we'll see you all next time.